Okay, we will turn then back to the epistle of, of John. It's towards the end of your Bibles. If you want to turn to the second chapter. Second chapter. I'm going to read from verses 18 through to the end of the chapter. So 1 John chapter 2 verses 18 through to verse 28 or 29 we'll read to. But our text that we're going to come from today is verse 28. So verse 28. Little children... It is the last time, and as ye have heard, the Antichrist shall come. Even now are there many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, but they were not of us. For if they had been of us, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not of us. But ye have an unction from the Holy One, and ye know all things. I have not written unto you because ye know not the truth, but because ye know it, and that no lie is of the truth. Who is a liar but he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ? He is Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Verse 23, Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Father also. Let that therefore abide in you, which ye have heard from the beginning. If that which ye have heard from the beginning shall remain in you, ye also shall continue in the Son and in the Father. And this is the promise that He hath promised us, even eternal life. These things have I written unto you concerning them that seduce you. But the anointing which ye have received of Him abideth in you. And ye need not that any man teach you, but as the same anointing teacheth you of all things, and is truth, and is no lie, and even as it hath taught you, ye shall abide in him. Verse 28. Now, little children, and now, forgive me, little children, abide in him, that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. If you know that he is righteous, ye know that everyone that doeth righteousness is born of him. That is the context to which we're going to come from today. A wonderful part of this epistle, a most challenging part. In our last visit, which was two weeks ago, we looked there very briefly, though it would take many, many weeks to really discuss this. I'm sure um, that would be an interesting one, but it talks of the last time. The last time. The Apostle John clearly is stating that he, he was in the last time. Therefore, so are we. We are in the last time. <coughs> As I said last time I spoke, that there has been some dogmatic views on this. We've always been easy to speak, to say, oh, we are in the last days. And yes, we are in, our last, in the last days. And we, could, we probably would be right to say that we are in the last of the last days. But neither you nor I know the day to which those skies will open and take his bride. But the skies, they will up. And one day he will take his people. And that will be the end. The last time. Theologians call it eschatology. It is the time between the ascension of Christ. To his coming again. 
it is that period to which the epistles throughout the scriptures tell of us two ages this age and the age to come I'm sure you will all know that there are varying interpretations on eschatology it is my view that we are now in the millennial age Christ reigns now from heaven But let me say this, I don't know, I don't know, and there are very, very important things to mention when we talk of eschatology, that there are good, good, faithful Christians on each side. But whatever is your position, the important thing is this. And this will always be the emphasis from me. Are you ready to meet that one who is coming? Are you ready for the return of the Christ? We acknowledge, didn't we, that the scriptures warn and tell us that there are, or will be, an antichrist. But that an antichrist in that last time, I'm sure that is one thing we agree on, that there will be an antichrist he will come with lying wonders and will deceive many and if it were possible the very elect will be deceived again I think we would agree that the day in which we live in today is awaiting that Antichrist. The stage is set. But what this world needs now is a saviour, as they would put it. Someone who is going to come and seem like the answer. We know this as well, do we not? Whether whatever and wherever you put yourself in that that eschatological view, wherever you put yourself, we know this, don't we, friends, brothers, sisters? The Christ will come, and Christ will defeat with the brightness of His coming. As we discuss, if we do discuss these things, may that be the ultimate. May that please be that which joins us. May we all say yes, I'm a, I'm a pre-tribber, I'm a mid-tribber, I'm a trip tri tribber who knows what it might be. But the point is this, our Saviour will come, the skies will open, and He will take His people. We went on, didn't we? We recognise that the Apostle John tells us not only of a coming Antichrist, but Antichrists are already here. I mentioned, I will not go into it again, but those people from the past, those evil dictators, not only from the past, but very much alive today, whose agenda is only evil and dictatorship. But the Apostle here is very clear, he doesn't go into that detail actually in any way, shape or form. He uses the plural Antichrist as one that denies the Father and the Son. It is those who went out from us, for they were not of us. False teachers, counterfeit Christians who are exposed by the light of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. But now John turns to a true believer and says this in verse 28. Now little children, abide in him. You 
abide in him. These that have gone out from us, they were not of us. But you, you abide in him. We're told in verse 27 that we have received of the anointing. We touched that briefly last week. We'll touch it again briefly this week. But that anointing, which is that God has given you of his spirit to believe that which you believe. And the Spirit abides in you. The Spirit lives and dwells in you. Apostle Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 6, 19. Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God? And ye, you, you, you're not your own. It's a similar thing. You have this Holy Spirit. This Holy Spirit lives inside of you. You have that anointing. He, God, abides in you. We have those words and we will read them from the, the Gospel of John. John 15. I am the true vine and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit is taken away. And every branch that beareth fruit, he purgeth it. That it may bring forth much fruit, more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Verse 4. Same writer, remember. Abide in me, Jesus says, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. These words are so familiar to us, aren't they? Abide in Him. We know that this is clear throughout the Scriptures that God abides in us. It's a union. You see, my friends, this morning, this is not some courtship that will only last for a time. But this will have no ending. This is a union between the triune God of heaven and his people. There's a permanency here. In Christ, as you read, as you do your reading as Christians, you, you go and you read your Bible and you might be reading through Ephesians and you might be reading through Philippians. You might be reading through Colossians again. You might even be reading through the Old Testament there or the Psalms and what you will pick up, particularly from the Apostle Paul and the other Apostles, they refer always to being in Christ Jesus. Ye that are in Christ Jesus. It's the union that we have. And we've made it so much less than that in Christianity today. It's just a passive, a believism. It's just something that we believe. I believe in Jesus. How easy it has become, these terminologies. And yes, we would all say, I hope that we believe in Jesus. But we use it as if it's some kind of mystic thing, like we believe in Santa Claus. No, friends, this is a union. This is a marriage. This is not a courtship. This is not a temporal relationship. This is an eternal, ever-living relationship. We look forward, don't we, to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Where Christ will be with his people for all eternity. And singing his praises for all eternity. The great celebration of the purchased bride to their Christ. This will occur. This will come. This is what is our future. If you be in Christ this morning, you will be at that marriage supper. How wonderful it is to have that certain hope. Again, let us refer to what the Apostle Paul tells us. If 
Ephesians 1, 13 to 14. In whom ye also trusted, after that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. In whom also, after that ye believed, <coughs> after that ye believed, listen to these words, friends, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit, Spirit of promise. Verse 14 says this, which is the earnest of our inheritance until the redeem, forgive me, until the redemption, the purchased possession, unto the praise of his glory. I'll read that again. Verse 13 and 14 <coughs> of Ephesians 1. In whom ye also trusted. After that ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also, after ye believed, ye, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, which is the earnest of our inheritance, until, until, when? The redemption of the purchased possession unto the praise of his glory. If you read Revelation 7, you will see one verse which is particularly interesting. It says this. I'll read from the top of Revelation chapter 7. After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding four winds of the earth, that we should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God. And he cried with a loud voice to four angels, to whom it was given, to hurt the earth and the sea, saying, hurt not, hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their foreheads. It's a similar thing. This is the giving of the Spirit. This is the sealing of the Spirit, the mark of your salvation, the Spirit of the living God. Until when? Until when? Until the day of redemption. That is the full salvation. We have been justified. We have been redeemed. We have been justified. We are now being sanctified. Are we not Christian? I hope so. From one degree, yes, of glory to another, we are being sanctified. But we look, don't we, for that day of glorification. That day that we shall, as the epistle here in 1 John speaks of, soon enough we'll get there, that when we see Him, we shall be like Him. There is that certainty, there is that hope, there is that sense of eternal life now, yet not yet complete. R.C. Sproul comments, he says this, The Spirit, the Holy Spirit, is not only a fulfilment of God's promise to indwell in His people, but also a guarantee that we will bring them to their full inheritance. As a down payment, a first instalment for the believer's full redemption. In the days where there weren't so much debt and credit. You used to be able to probably go to the shop and put a down payment on. Older people should be nodding their heads to me to encourage me. That's what you did. Yes. And you put it down. And you make that payment. And that is now certainly yours. You see, he that begun a good work in you. will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. Again, the same terms as Paul says to those in Ephesians. He that begun a good work in you will perform it until the day of Jesus Christ. If we do not have these great certainties, how can we then endeavour to be assured of our salvation? The assurance of salvation is something that many, many believers still struggle with and will struggle with. But God has given of His Spirit 
God has given us that privilege, that pleasure, that joy, that certainty. And how do we know? How is it that we know that we can today, as I prayed, we cry out, I'm sure some of us cry out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus. How is it that you today can know whether if tonight is your last sleep, that you know that heaven is awaiting you? How is it that some of us who have lost loved ones, we know right now they are absent from the body and present with the Lord. How is it that we know? Because he's given of his spirit as a down payment. So God abides in us, friends. He has made his home in us. We are, as we have read and quoted, that we are the temple. We are the temple of the Holy Spirit. The world thinks that that just should mean that we should not smoke and eat spinach all day long. <laughs> That's naivety. But it is that we are called and set apart to be holy. That the third person, yes, you hear that, the third person of the triune God dwells and lives in a believer. And I think that we have lost sight of that. He lives in you. He has sealed you with it. But as we read verse 28, we are encouraged to abide in him. So does the believer, or is the believer left with no responsibility? God dwells in me and I'm saved. Christ dwells in me. How, how precious a doctrine. So feet up time. You see, that's where these things can lead. That's why there's so much antagonism over these things. Is that the attitude of a, a spirit-filled man, if you like? I've been saved. Job done. My friends, I will say to you this morning, if you think like that, it's very possible. In fact, I dare say certain that you have not got God dwelling in you. You can't think that. You won't be like that. Why? 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17 says, If any man be in Christ is a new creature, the old is gone, the new has come. We have been given a new heart. That is the work of the Spirit. We are not a, a lazy or a, a slothful people, are we not? If God has made his home in you, we are not slothful in our praise. We are not slothful in our walk. We are not slow in our pursuit of Him. We are ever hungry and desirous of His Word. We are desirous of fellowship. We are desirous to partake in the sacraments. Not because they save us, but because we are saved. Because the Spirit of God lives in you. Uh, again, I watched a Q&A with, with uh, Steve Lawson last night. And he said, what is the greatest problem of the church today? Or what do we need to, again, hear in the church today? You'd expect, wouldn't you, somebody who is a great theologian in his mind and, 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 and is wonderful in his display and his writing and all the rest of it. But he said something so simple and profound and it's this. And I heartily say amen to it. He said, we need to preach again that you must be born again. You must be born again, folks. You must be born again to enter the kingdom of heaven. Not have a certain eschatology. Your eschatology won't save you. You've got, you're, you're tithing. If you do, won't save you. You being here, we heard it this last, last week, didn't we? You being here doesn't save you. You may be here 
For one of two reasons. Because you are desperate to come to the first day of the week to give worship and thanks to the God who has saved you. Or you're here because it's just something that you do on a Sunday. <clears throat> what is then somebody who abides in Christ? We're encouraged here in this verse to abide in Him. How are we to be? Or rather, what will we be? Abide in Him, the Apostle says. What does this mean? What does it mean to, to abide in God, to abide in Christ? We've kind of touched what it means to, for Christ to abide in us. He's made His home in us. The Spirit of God dwells in us. What is our part? Have we a part? Absolutely we have a part. A simple word study will help. To abide means to dwell. To continue. Tarry. Faithful. To stand fast. You see, we who have come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and his gospel are here encouraged by the Apostle John to continue continuing. We ought to be a people who are steadfast and habitual in our pursuit of Him. Christianity is not for an hour and a half on a Sunday morning. Christianity is not ticking the boxes of a religious way of life. We are called, friends, this morning to abide in Him. We are called to abide in Him. And when John refers to abiding in Christ, he is refer referring to persevering. You are called to persevere, to abide in Him, to make your home in Him, to trust wholly and fully upon Him in all things. Which I want to say to you this morning is the very evidence of a true believer. It's an evidence. You're abiding in Him is an evidence that this morning you are a true believer. Remember the passage in which we're coming from. They went out from us because they were not of us. But you, you abide in Him. John Gill says this, to exercise of faith on Him, of hope in Him, and love to Him, and to hold fast to His Word, and his gospel. That's what it means to abide in him, friends. Do you hold fast to his word? <coughs> Is your only hope fully upon his gospel? That's the question. Where lies your hope? Where lies your faith? What is it that you truly abide in? What is it that you truly believe upon? I'll read again. To exercise a faith on Him. Is our hope on Him? You see, I believe that for myself, maybe for you, that these terminologies we are so conditioned to. I believe upon Him. I have faith in Christ. The things that we use probably in our daily life. But do we truly hold fast to His Word? Do we truly believe on the full, complete, redeeming work of Jesus Christ? Is that our hope? Is that where we have made our home? No matter, no matter what storms or trials may come. No matter how much sin continues to knock at the door. No matter how times get harder. Is our hope only upon Jesus Christ? Or is it in Jesus Christ plus? As long, I trust in Jesus as long as. My hope is in Jesus as well as. Now we won't say those things for they are not theologically right. But how is our heart? Trust in Christ as long as my children are well. 
I'm trusting Christ as long as my savings don't go below such and such. I'm trusting Christ when the church seems to be full. I'm trusting Christ when this corona is over. Or is it that we are absolutely and fully, wholeheartedly trusting in this Jesus? That is what it means to abide in Him. You see, if we truly abide in Christ, we'll have a continued and a continuing perseverance in faith for all things and above all for salvation and will hold fast to the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Who said being a Christian was easy? Who said Christianity was an easy life? My friends, we have seen that we not. It is going to be hard. It is going to get harder. And if you do not abide in Him, you will not make it. That's the reality. That's the truth. But if we are continually continuing, we have every joy and every hope. You got through tomorrow, you will get through today. Because we have been sealed with the Spirit as a down payment. If there's any hope, if there's anything that will encourage you today, if you have been filled of His Spirit, you can walk from out of here with a head lifted high because He has given you a promise until the day of redemption. And we will continue continuing, persevering in faith for salvation and will hold fast to the gospel of Jesus Christ. We read this further on in chapters, one, uh, chapters 4, verses 13, 14 and 15. 1 John 4, 13, 14 and 15 and 16. <laughs> Hereby we know we that dwell in him And he in us. Why? How do we know? How do we know? Your text is the same as mine. It says this. He hath given us of his spirit. If you reject a triune God, you cannot be a Christian. If you reject a triune God, you cannot be a Christian. We see, don't we, there, as we go on, we have seen, we do testify that the Father sent the Son to be the Saviour of the world. Whosoever shall confess that Jesus is the Son of God, God dwelleth in him, and he in God. And we have known and believed the love that God hath to us. God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. It's the same there as John 15. We know that we dwell in him. Why? Because he has given of his spirit. He has given you his spirit. The third person of the Godhead. How do we know then that we have the Spirit? What a question. How do we know that we have the Spirit living in us? And pause it not so you answer me, but so you consider. How do we know that we have the Holy Spirit living in us? Well, the context tells us very simply. Who shall confess that Jesus Christ is the Son of God? God dwelleth in him. Have you believed? Have you
you believe that Christ is the one to whom he says he was and is? Have you come to that saving knowledge of the gospel? Have you confessed your sin? Have you repented and believed upon this gospel? Is your life telling you that you have done that? If the answer is an affirmative yes, the Spirit of God lives in you. 1 Corinthians 12 verse 4 You can turn to it, please. 1 Corinthians 12. Something that's just skated over. Verse 3 it is, forgive me. Wherefore I give unto you understand, and understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calleth Jesus accursed. And that no man can say that Jesus is the Lord, but by the Holy Ghost. We have known and believed that the love of God hath to us, and God is love, and he that dwelleth in love dwelleth in God, and God in him. My friends, this morning, if you have come to that saving knowledge, and I say saving knowledge with great purpose, because there is a knowledge that does not save. But there is a knowledge that does save. And that is saving knowledge. That is, as we have quoted already, that you are born again. That you have experienced that transforming work of Jesus Christ. He has given you a heart that now loves him. That he has transferred you from, his, from darkness into his glorious light. That is the work of the Holy Spirit and so often in the church today that part of the work of the Spirit of God is pushed aside. But this is, this is regeneration. If you have been regenerate or are regenerate you have the Spirit of God living in you and you can comfortably and happily and joyously know that you are a Christian. The abiding man knows that, or is learning to know that. The man who abides, why do I abide? Why do you abide in God, in Christ this morning? Because you have the Spirit of God living in you. You see, how wonderful is this Gospel? On the day of Pentecost, as I'm sure Russell will come to, he says, we have this promise, don't we? promise of being given the Holy Spirit. Without the Holy Spirit, friend, you have no Christian life. You have no Christian life, but one who abides, I want to say this morning, is a Spirit-filled person. A Spirit-filled man, a Spirit-filled woman, a man who is led by the Word. And I say it again with a humongous repetition I know, but what is the Word of God to you? What is the pages of His Holy Scripture to you? Measure it. Ask yourself of it fairly. An abiding man is a man who, who is strengthened and filled with a love for Jesus Christ that cannot be quenched. An abiding man is a man or a woman growing in the love of righteousness. What is that in your life or in my life that we, are you changing? Are those sins that are in your life, are they falling away? Are you growing in love for righteousness, not only in your own life, but in the lives of those around you? You cannot no longer dwell where sinners dwell. Not because you are holier than thou, but you cannot put yourself in all the mess of the world. You can't stay there because the Spirit of God lives in you. You can't be surrounded by the cursing and the cussing. 
You can't be surrounded by the perverse talk, the jest of joke, the horrid sense of evil. You cannot be there. Why? Because the Spirit of Christ dwells in you. That's why. Not because you're holier than the next. No, because God has made his home in you. You can't be there anymore. You can't be with those folk anymore. Just can't. Why? Because you love him and growing in love for holiness. Is that you, friends? Or are you content to be in a crowd of wickedness? An abiding man will be a man who is daily mortifying the deeds of sin and of the flesh. Are you living a sanctified life? Are you killing that temptation? Are you doing away with those things that you know are not pleasing to God? Are you changing? You see, ultimately, an abiding man is a man who is poor in spirit, who mourns over sin, yet, yet, rejoices in the God of his salvation. It's almost a paradox, isn't it? There's that inner grief, that mourning. If you are a Christian this morning and you are growing in sanctification, and if you hear me correctly, we're not talking about perfection this side of eternity, you will never achieve it. But you have a desire to achieve it. You have a desire to want to please your master. You have a desire to do away with that innate sin, that thing that is ever there. <coughs> That's an abiding man. That's a man who loves Christ. That's a man who is consumed by the God of his salvation. Christian life is a paradox in many ways. It's a fight, yet it's a sweet pilgrimage. I want to say this morning, the one who abides in Christ, he's a well-saved man. He is well-saved. His eternity is sure. A persevering man. Man changing from one degree of glory to another. You may be able to look back a month, a month, two months, three months, four months, a year, two years, for some of you 20 years. And say, I'm not what I was. I cannot partake in that. I cannot do that. Not because I want to tick that religious box. No, no. But you can't. I cannot now watch that. I cannot now listen to that. I cannot hold that company. Drunkenness should have gone. Why? Another box to take, my friend. If that's what you're hearing, you are mistaken. But because the God of heaven dwells in you. And you dwell in him. You're in that union. Jesus tells us something wonderful, doesn't he, as we sum up. That that man, of course when I say man, I mean mankind. Man, woman, those people, those who abide in him. What does John the Apostle tell us? It says something profound and wonderful and sweet. That when he, Christ, shall appear. We may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. There is a day, is there not, when those skies will open. There is a day, my friends, when that shall occur. But this man, the man to whom has been described, will not be ashamed at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. The man to whom has the seal of Christ upon him. The man who abides has confidence and no shame on that last day. Whatever your eschatology might be. On that day, friend, there will be no shame if you abide in him and he in you. Why? I think we've covered that, haven't we? Not because you are sinless. Not because you have achieved anything or lived a religious life. Oh no. Romans 9 
33 tells us, As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offence. Listen to this. This is the simplicity of this message. Whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. So many of us walk in shame, don't we? Even now. Yet again we've sinned. Yet again we've thought. Yet again we've done that which is offensive to our God. But I want to say to you this morning, dear friends, trust upon the full redeeming work of Jesus Christ and you will not be ashamed. You will not be ashamed. Those who believe on him shall on that day, on that final day, on that last day as the scriptures tell us, shall not be ashamed. Those who abide in him and him in you have every confidence on that last day. We should not live in fear. We should not live as though we are afraid of death. And oh, how we have been shown up these last 12 months. Have we not? Death awaits us, friends. It is sure and it is certain. The day is set for you, either to be taken in death or to see him at his coming on that last day. Have you today be reason to be ashamed? Have you not yet believed? Have you not abided in this Jesus? I would call you today and do if that had not been so to believe upon this Christ to lean, to, to, to lean upon him repent and turn from your sin and believe upon him do not trust in your attendance at church to get you into heaven do not trust in your ever giving do not trust in that which you label as good works do not trust because you are friends with the minister. Do not trust that you have attended this church. And, oh, do not trust that we stayed open during the lockdown. That it makes no addition to your salvation, friend. Nor mine. Don't trust on that which is temporal. Trust on that which is eternal. The Lord Jesus Christ, the Saviour of the world. Too many of us are trusting on what we can do. Rather than trusting in the one who has done it. Trust in him. You may, and I hope you do say to me, or say in your heart right now, Oh, I have believed upon this Jesus. I believe upon this Christ. I have been transformed from darkness into his glorious life. I have experienced what it means to be born anew. Go on from here then, in this confidence, in the confidence of the blood of the Lamb, without fear of death or without fear of his coming. For you have nothing to be ashamed, for you are covered with the blood of the Lamb. My friends, I want to say to you, and finish with these words before we break bread and sing our final hymns. This is the will of God for you. To walk in that joy and to walk in that assurance that you are His. Maybe so. In the name of Jesus. Amen.